welcome everybody to, to this event on dual class shares, which is jointly hosted by the Edinburgh Law School Centre for Commercial Law, um, the School of Law at King's College London, and the Centre for Business Research at the University of Cambridge. Uh, my name is Anna Christie. I'm on the faculty at Edinburgh Law School, and I'm also a research associate at the Centre for Business Research in Cambridge. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be sharing this event where we have an absolutely brilliant lineup of, of speakers from across academia, industry and practice. Um, I won't spend too much time introducing the topic as, at hand as I'm, I'm super keen to ensure we have enough time to hear from all of our expert speakers and, and have a really engaging interactive discussion after the formal presentations. Um, so just very briefly, I'm, I'm I'd like to note that we're really glad to have representatives here who advised both the Khalifa FinTech Review and the UK listing review produced by Lord Hill. So um, as I'm sure many of you know, both of these reviews proposed amendments to the UK listing rules in order to improve the, the UK's competitiveness as an attractive location for IPOs. And we'll be focusing primarily on the UK in today's event, although the topic of dual class shares is one of global interest, um, especially with regard to, to issues of regulatory competition. So I'm also really pleased that we have a, a very global audience here today with participants from all over the world. And the last few months have certainly been a, a very eventful time in relation to, to this topic of dual class shares. So, so shortly after the publication of Lord Hill's listing review in, in March this year, we of course um, saw the Deliveroo IPO, which um, some journalists have described as the worst IPO in London's history. <laughs> and, and many well-known institutional investors stated they, they wouldn't invest in the company due to its dual class share structure, uh, among other issues. And at present, Deliveroo has a, a standard listing where there's no restriction on companies listing with a dual class share structure, but the, the Hill review reforms proposed um, to enable such companies to become premium listed and um, some subject to a number of safeguards. And this matters for, for many reasons, but particularly because of the um, ever growing landscape of passive index investment funds and um, tracking premium listed companies that are constituents of indices like the, the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 250. So, so standard listed companies lose out on, on those investments. In addition to our representatives who have advised on the, the Khalifa and Hill reviews, we're extremely privileged to have eminent experts from academia, legal practice and the investor community here with us this evening to discuss this very topical and controversial issue. So I'm sure we'll hear a range of different perspectives, which we hope will also lead to a, a fascinating and engaging discussion after the, the presentations. In, in terms of, of the structure of the event, as, as Ewan just mentioned, um, during the first hour, we'll hear from each of our speakers in turn, who will outline their, their initial thoughts for approximately eight minutes each. And then in the second hour, we're going to open it up to, to the audience for, for Q&A. In terms of asking questions after um, the speakers have concluded their, their presentations, you're all very welcome to raise your hands on Zoom using the, the raise hand feature, and then you can ask your questions or make your comments live. Or if you prefer, you can send us your written questions in the chat feature, either during the presentations or afterwards, and hopefully we can get to all those written questions as well. In, in terms of cameras, it's always nice to see everyone's lovely faces, so please do feel free to switch on your camera um, if, if you're able to do so. Um, and before I hand things over to our, our speakers, I'd like to thank Ewan McGahey for all his work in organising this event uh, this evening. And I'd also like to thank um, Ian McGee in the events, uh, uh, the Edinburgh Law School events team for, for all his help with the, the administrative aspects as well. I should say that two of our speakers may have to drop off the Zoom call a little bit early, so, so before the, the 7 p.m. sort of official close. So I'd, I'd like to extend my thanks uh, in advance of the presentations to, to all of the speakers who've, who've kindly um, accepted our invitation to, to speak tonight. Okay, with, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our first speaker, Anne Glover. <laughs> 
So Anne is the, the chief executive and co-founder of Amadeus Capital Partners, um, which is an, a venture capital firm that invests in European uh, high technology companies. Anne has been an active venture capitalist for over 30 years. Um, she is the former chair of the British Private Equity and Venture Capital Association and is a non-executive director of the court at the Bank of England. And she was also awarded a, a CBE for services to business. And we're really excited to hear Anne's perspective on this issue today, as she was a key figure in the Khalifa review on UK fintech. And in that role, she led research and recommendations for the chapter on investment. Um, Anne, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Oh, Anne, I think you, you're muted. Um, I muted myself, so I didn't cut across you. Is, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm honoured to be here. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, obviously, as a venture capitalist, I normally work with very early stage companies. So you might ask, why uh, do I care about something as uh, far away as uh, listing and dual class shares? And the answer is that um, all of the success of growth companies comes from the way in which an ecosystem works. And an ecosystem works by enabling entrepreneurs of various flavors, um, whether scientific or fintech, uh, to create entities that ultimately grow and succeed within that ecosystem. And what we have in the UK is a disconnect between the innovation agenda and capital markets. And the disconnect happens in both public markets and in private markets where the growth capital that allows an innovative company to grow and mature to the stage that it is merits being a listed company um, is largely supplied, if at all, by foreign investors. And the foreign investors um, make a very good return from this growth capital, whether they be Canadian, Australian or US pension funds or indeed in even in enlisted uh, securities um, from uh, elsewhere. The, the conservative nature of our latest stage asset management community means that they do not naturally reach down into private markets or in, indeed into more junior um, uh, listed markets to invest with Bailey Gifford being a notable exception. Whereas Wellington, Fidelity, et cetera, fully understand the merits of being part of the growth ladder. So why does this matter to me and to the UK economy? Why I care about it is that um, if we lose our listings to other markets from companies that start here, um, we may, and we often do, give great returns to our investors, but the center of gravity of both leadership and in some cases R&D moves elsewhere. And this happens naturally when the capital that is supporting the growth tends to come from overseas, who know the, the degree in which um, the, role, the, ro the road to NASDAQ is so well trodden. So some, some uh, uh, shocking statistics are over just under 4,000 listings worldwide in the last five years. 39% were in the US, NASDAQ and NYSE, and 4.5% were in London. Now, within the FinTech community, which is the area that I was looking at for the Khalifa review, the revenues that our fintech companies generate is, is closer to 8.5% of, of total global. So we are actually, in terms of our economic input, um, more significant, and we are in danger of losing it unless we create an environment where these scale companies feel comfortable being domiciled here for the long term. And it's really important that we have these champions that end up being a place where leadership can grow, 
where talent can be nurtured, where people can spin out from and do it all over again. And so you need the full chain from startup right through to um, listing. And I don't mean just listing. I mean the creation of a, of a Decacorn and a, and a FTSE 100 community that is followed and then supported by asset managers and analysts um, the like in London. So everyone was interested in this. Then the question became, why is it not happening? I've explained one reason, which is that the growth capital is, is coming from elsewhere and the bias of the boards at that time will tend to, to argue to go to um, usually a US market, but not always. But the second reason is a series of obstacles in the listing space. And I'm here to talk about dual class share specifically, but there, it's not the only one. The, the free float it was clearly a problem because if you have a very successful company that's reached a billion in value or more, which is probably what it needs to be in order to be considered viable for a, a proper listing, even in London today, the, the, uh, the listing of a 25% block means that you have to find 25% selling shareholders. And that's actually pretty hard. And particularly if it turns out that, that founders want to stay in and uh, existing investors may or may not want to liquidate immediately upon IPO, but would rather hold for two or three years as a crossover fund, like a, like a Bailey Gifford or a Wellington or a, a Fidelity. So reducing the free, free float matters as long as it is of a size that is liquid enough for asset managers to achieve the liquidity that they expect from a public listing. So that was a key recommendation from the point of view of the investors, primarily from the point of view of investors. But when you actually talked to the entrepreneurs themselves, you found that while that mattered, in fact, this issue of uh, dual class shares became um, really front and central in their thinking. And it was not born of um, the desire to uh, sort of control something forever, a la Mark Zuckerberg. It was born of a genuine fear that they had seen the London market be a place where because of macroeconomic volatility and because it takes a while for a young company to mature into its own um, communication pattern, that they would be vulnerable to uh, immediate short-term takeover if there was a uh, volatility in the share price that did not represent the long-term value potential of a company. And there, uh, and with you know a r bump in the road, then investors might just take uh, take the opportunity. So we talked uh, among the entrepreneurial community, and it became apparent that yes, of course, the standard market was an option, and the Hut Group was successful, and Deliveroo was not successful. Both of them chose the standard market route. Uh, because that enabled them to issue um, some kind of dual class share. I do not think that the delivery debacle had much to do with dual class shares at all. I think it had a lot to do with employment practices. That's a personal opinion. Um, but it is very clear that uh, the Hutt Group was hugely successful. So it is investor specific. But what became apparent is that there were a number of compromises that entrepreneurs were willing to live with. For example, that uh, any type of dual class share could be time limited, do not know what time is appropriate, but that this was a sort of maturing phase of a new company on a listed exchange. So we're not asking for eternity, they were asking for a period of time in which they could, in their own mind, protect their investment. The second was that um, there was not a desire for it to be widely distributed necessarily. So it wasn't dual class shares, it was actually more likely to be a golden share, where there is vested in, in one uh, genuine entrepreneur who's probably founded the company in the first place, who therefore um, would act on behalf of, um, of not just 
uh, frankly, the management team, but possibly also the early investors who still had not achieved liquidity. And the UK has this golden share concept and uh, it has worked well. So we were not talking about uh, creating a class of uh, have and have not citizens, but a mechanism by which um, in effect, uh, sort of a rapacious takeover uh, in during a volatile moment in time um, would be prevented by uh, 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 through this mechanism. So I became convinced that this was um, a good idea and that it didn't in any way in the long run violate the idea that that capital markets are good at establishing uh, price discovery and, and liquidity, which we all need in mature companies, but that the mechanism of a guillotine where you go from private to public and have all the vagaries of public scrutiny all at once was probably better mediated by some intermediate set of steps. So we, uh, we put forward a recommendation, which was frankly that, that Lord Hill Review take over uh, looking at this and the FCA um, also. And it was supported lastly by a piece of work done by a well-known venture capital group in, the, in Silicon Valley called Andreessen Horowitz, where they basically demonstrated that uh, founder-run public companies where there is some control among the founders had tended to outperform um, uh, manager for hire um, uh, public companies who uh, did not necessarily understand the full vision and the full potential. So we're not saying it, use, it needs to be for everyone. It's, it's for a certain category of company that is perhaps uh, unusual in having been found to run from the beginning. Uh, but that the option is important and that it's available in the standard market is not sufficient. These are ambitious guys who want to be in the best market with the best access to investors so that while the standard market may be a good, may seem like a place for it to uh, uh, be, a, be possible, it's actually not what um, the best entrepreneurs want. If they want it, they want to be on the premium market. And um, that really is the argument from an entrepreneur's perspective for a dual class share. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, that, was, that was super interesting to hear your, your perspectives from, from talking to various constituents in, in relation to the Khalifa review. Um, I'll, I'll swiftly um, move on to our, our next speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Luca Enriquez. Um, Luca is a professor of corporate law at the University of Oxford and a fellow of Jesus College. He is also a, a research fellow and board member at ECGI, the, the European Corporate Governance Institute, and a fellow academic member of the European Banking Institute, where he co-chairs its fintech task force. Luca has published extensively in the fields of company law, corporate governance and financial regulation, and he's also one of the founding academic editors of the Oxford Business Law blog, uh, where he recently published an insightful blog post on, on this very topic on, on dual class shares and the Hill Review. So we're really delighted to, to welcome Luca to this event. Uh, over to you, Luca. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction and, for, and thank you and you and for having me today. I will uh, in my eight minutes I, I try to make two points uh, i don't know whether uh, it, it will be enough <laughs> in terms of time but uh, uh, let me start immediately so i would like first to make a general point about why dual class shares may be a good thing in today's um, environment markets environment because we, we know that there are many well-known rationales uh, uh, to allow for dual class uh, share companies. Uh, the main one uh, which uh, was already hinted at, at uh, by uh, Anne is the idea that the market may misjudge uh, companies, especially new innovative ones. They may impose uh, their own uh, uh, standardized views on what the strategies should be, what, what kind of innovation the company should focus on. Uh, 
uh, whereas uh, founders usually have uh, uh, their own idiosyncratic view, vision that they want to pursue uh, independently of pressures from the market. But uh, I, I would like to focus on a, an additional ra rationale, we, which is one, uh, again, just uh, which is more, more recent in, in terms of what, what's going on. Th that is the idea that nowadays um, we are uh, in, a, in a market environment dominated by portfolio value maximizers by institutional investors whose goal is to maximize the value of uh, uh, whole uh, portfolios rather than the value of each individual company they invest in. And, and so at, at the same time, of course, we have other uh, um, market players, namely founders and controlling shareholders or, or, or even managers when they have the right incentives that may want to maximize uh, firm value if they can. And, and so the, the portfolio, va portfolio value maximizers are now dominating, uh, especially in the US and in the UK. And um, um, this uh, has good effects and bad, as we know. So for, for companies that uh, produce uh, uh, huge uh, externalities, it may be good to have a dominance of uh, portfolio value maximizers because they will, uh, to some degree, internalize the externalities of the individual companies at the portfolio level and therefore may push companies to, uh, for example, uh, uh, emit uh, less uh, uh, greenhouse gases or uh, pollute less. But for uh, non, uh, let, let's call it not systematically uh, relevant uh, companies, firm value maximization is uh, important, uh, first of all, because uh, uh, of uh, a, a high key and uh, view of the benefits of competition, uh, having decentralized uh, decision making in society is good for value creation. But secondly, also uh, because uh, we need uh, companies to compete rather than collude and uh, with uh, um, horizontal shareholdings uh, so widespread now in the economy, uh, thanks to the presence of, of a, a large universal owners, there is a higher risk of collusion. And uh, so dual class share structures can also be explained as uh, an attempt by the founders of a company to signal to the market that their company will be run as a firm value maximizing company instead of being influenced by the presence of uh, institutional investors, which uh, may be less keen on the disruptive innovation, but which may come from individual company uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, from the, the heightened competition that may come from that kind of uh, um, pri prioritization of, of goals at the individual company level. So, um, that is why, uh, and this is uh, something that uh, I have been developing with uh, uh, Sandra Romano in a paper that is available on SSRN. Actually, we, we will spin this out and make it a, an independent paper. But um, so what, what is relevant here is that, um, uh, hence, uh, uh, there are the, the, the the signal that is, is uh, sent to the market will be credible. Um, on the one hand, if the founders will have a, a, a significant fun, financial stake in the company, that's pretty obvious, but also if uh, it is not time constrained, uh, if, if there is no sunset there, because otherwise the, there is a little credibility in this uh, commitment. That, that is why uh, a, a sunset is inconsistent with this rationale. It may be less inconsistent as unnoticed with the other uh, rationale, uh, which is uh, to this issue of uh, uh, idiosyncratic vision uh, against uh, the uh, standardized view of markets. 
uh, this was my first point. I, I have, I think, another couple of minutes, but the other point is, is less uh, uh, conspicuous. Also, it's something that uh, Anne's word made less relevant because she said that uh, a top class uh, founding entrepreneurs will want to be in the best possible market. And so that, that's the, the rationale for going there, much less than uh, what you you read also in the Hill Review as, as one important aspect, which is that if only if you are in the premium segment, you can be admitted, included in the FTSE Russell indexes, which is uh, again something that in, in the literature is uh, um, said to be uh, relevant. The, the problem with, with uh, this uh, um, um, rationale for admitting uh, companies with dual class shares in the in the premium ma market is that it may not uh, achieve the the goal that the goal of uh, of having companies admitted uh, to to uh, included into indexing because uh, uh, it's uh, not enough to be a, a premium listed uh, in in theory at least uh, in order to be in, within an index it's uh, the FTSE Russell company which decides the criteria, decides on the criteria that apply in order to be um, admitted to an index. And uh, it is well known that uh, uh, these uh, companies, these index providers make the decisions after listening carefully to the um, desiderata of their uh, users. And the users are the U, mainly uh, the US and UK institutional investors, which we know to be very much averse uh, to um, having uh, th these uh, companies, dual class listed companies in uh, indexes. So basically, I don't think that the Hill uh, review proposals we will achieve much so long as there is this. Uh, aversion to dual class structure on the part of institutional investors, then uh, it, it will be interesting to see the dynamics uh, play out there because uh, as, as you know, FTSE Russell is owned by the London Stock Exchange Group, which has its own interest in, of course, uh, uh, um, enticing uh, these companies to, to list uh, on the London Stock Exchange, but but on, on the other hand, uh, we also have a, a, a benchmark a regulation which applies to index providers, which requires the index uh, provider to be independent uh, and uh, to have a conflict of interest policy that should prevent the owners from uh, um, affecting the decision the decisions of the index provider. So, so um, that, that is uh, all of my part. I have exhausted my eight minutes. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. Thanks so much, Luca. Um, our, our, our third speaker is um, Claire Keith Butler, um, who is a partner in the, the London office of the American institutional law firm, sorry, <laughs> the American international law firm uh, Cooley LLP. Um, so Cooley is particularly known for its technology and life sciences practices, as well as its experience uh, with IPOs and venture capital financings. Claire's practice focuses on capital markets transactions, so she represents issuers, investment banks and investors on IPOs and secondary offerings. And Claire has published uh, various opinion pieces advocating for a rethink on uh, the UK's restrictive rules on, on dual class shares, so we're really looking forward to hearing her thoughts on this issue. Great. Thanks, Anna, and thanks you, and thanks thanks for having having me here today. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Claire Keith Butler. I'm a partner at Cooley, which is an international law firm focusing on capital markets and public companies. Um, at Cooley, we regularly work with founders of disruptive companies, um, particularly in the technology sector, as well as the venture capital firms that back them. Um, we are a Silicon Valley heritage firm, so we're very familiar with dual class structures why pre-IPO shareholders want them and some of the key considerations and issues surrounding them, um, taking it from what we see in the US and, and looking at, at the UK and Europe. Um, we've been vocal in our support for dual cost structures and, and regulatory reform to, to ease them in the UK. Um, we've covered some of this already, but I thought just 
taking a minute to go back to basics and say, what is a dual class share structure? Um, a traditional share structure for, for an English company certainly is one share, one vote. Um, so each shareholder has one share for each vote that they hold, for each um, share that they hold. Um, a dual class structure involves two different classes of shares with differential voting rights. Um, this would be put in place at or shortly before the time the company does an IPO. Um, and what that means is that founders and potentially other pre-IPO shareholders are able to maintain voting control of the publicly listed company through holding shares with enhanced voting rights compared to the shares held by public shareholders. Um, so for example, the most commonly seen um, dual class structure certainly in the US is you know, the founders and the pre-IPO shareholders may have 10 votes per share, uh, while the shares held by public shareholders have one vote per share. Um, and typically the high vote shares will convert into low vote shares when they're sold. Um, so you can't sell the high vote share in the high vote form. Um, so control is held by the early holders that continue to hold the shares once the company goes public. Um, what, why do companies want dual class share structures? What, what do we see sort of on, on the ground talking to companies? Um, I'd say Anne and Luca covered this excellently already. Uh, we do see this structure as being particularly attractive to rapidly growing companies, especially in the technology sector, where founders wish to retain voting control following an IPO. Um, and they would argue that the traditional one share, one vote capital structure isn't appropriate for companies on their trajectory and at their growth stage. Um, one key argument in favor of dual class structures is that they allow visionary founders to concentrate on the business's long-term strategy, growth and performance without having to focus on duly on short-term targets um, and being subject to shareholder activism while they're still in this high growth phase and when they've just joined the public markets. Uh, what's the, the legal position in the UK? Um, as Anne said, dual class structures are possible as a matter of English company law. Um, you can bake it into the share rights and the articles of association of the company and, and work out the mechanism for converting from high to, low, high to low vote shares. Um, however, as has been touched upon already, as things currently stand, a company with a dual class structure wouldn't be eligible for listing on the premium segment um, of the FCA's official list, as that requires a one share, one vote capital structure, um, although a company with a dual class structure could seek a listing on the standard segment of the official list. Um, this may be um, known to everyone already, but I thought I'd just explain the difference, again, as, as people have touched upon, between a premium and a standard listing. Both are a listing on the London Stock Exchange, on the main regulated market of the London Stock Exchange, um, but the premium segment is the highest segment with the highest eligibility requirements and continuing obligations, um, as well as eligibility for the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 250, as has already been mentioned, assuming that the other eligibility requirements for those indices are met. Um, the standard listing segment um, has sort of lower eligibility and ongoing obligations. It's based on um, what was the traditional EU minimum requirements under the, the, the EU directives. Um, so the, the requirements both at listing and on an ongoing basis are significantly less onerous. Um, what, what do we see in other jurisdictions? Um, dual class structures are permitted and are relatively common in the United States, um, especially for technology companies. Um, high profile examples include Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Zynga and Snap. Um, Snap actually has a publicly listed class of shares that has no votes. Uh, which is, is at the extreme end. Um, since 2018, companies with dual class structures have been able to list on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange um, in certain circumstances and subject to certain requirements and restrictions. Um, following these rule changes, um, the company Alibaba dual listed in Hong Kong alongside its existing New York Stock Exchange listing, um, raising uh, 88 billion Hong Kong dollars um, in late 2019. Um, and Singapore also changed its rules in 2018 to allow for dual class structures. Um, closer to home, dual class structures are also possible in other European jurisdictions, um, including notably I would say Amsterdam, um, which is a market we increasingly see as a strong option for listing for European tech companies um, and is, is often sort of up there when companies are considering where to list if they want to list in the UK or Europe. So what are we seeing in the market? Um, there have been a number of high profile IPOs recently that have employed different variants on the dual class structure. And again, these have been touched upon already. Um, in the case of the Huck Group last autumn, the founder held a special share, which effectively allowed him to block a takeover offer for three years after the listing. Um, whereas in the case of the delivery IPO in the spring, the founder held a separate class of high vote shares, which had 20 votes per share on all shareholder votes. Um, as compared to one vote per share for the other class, but was time limited. 
Um, as has already been mentioned, both the Huck Group and Delivery listed on the standard segment of the official list, um, as these structures would currently render them ineligible for a premium listing. Um, and we are aware of other companies working towards the listing in London in the near future with other variants on this dual class share structure. Um, we reviewed Lord Hill's listing review with interest, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Chris's insights on that shortly. Um, the Lord Hill review recommended allowing companies with dual class share structures to list on the premium segment, but with certain conditions um, that would include a maximum duration of five years, a maximum weighted voting ratio of 20 to one, um, requiring the holders to be high vote, the high vote shares to be directors of the company um, in order to maintain that high vote status. And, and also limiting the voting matters to ensuring the holders are able to continue as a director and being able to block a change of control of the company while the dual, dual class share structure is in force and really going to that core reason for having, having the dual class share structure as, as Anne spoke about so eloquently earlier. Um, and there are also limitations on transfer of the B class shares. Um, we see this as a very welcome development, um, but it's worth noting that it still wouldn't allow a dual class structure on the premium segment in the form we would most typically see in the US. Um, and there's two key parts to that. Um, in particular, in the US, in the majority of cases, all of the pre IPO shareholders hold the high vote shares. Um, so, not just the founders who will be directors of the company, but all of the shareholders before the IPO have the opportunity to hold the high vote shares. And that wouldn't be available with, with these proposed, proposed changes. Um, and then secondly, the weighted voting rights in the US would typically apply on all matters, um, not just relating to the holders continuing as directors of the company and being able to block a change of control. Um, so companies that want a true US style dual class structure would still need to list on the segment, standard segment rather than the premium segment, even if these changes are enacted. Um, as Luca said, changing the rules is only part of the solution. We see this as a, a very welcome development, but part of a broader package of measures to make the UK a more attractive place for technology companies. And, and, and why does this matter? Um, the capital markets are increasingly international and UK and European companies have a choice of listing on a number of different exchanges. Um, we see a lot of exciting UK and European companies in the disruptive technology sectors that are likely to be at the stage of looking at a potential IPO in the coming few years. Um, and we would very much like to see Cooley, like to, we at Cooley would very much like to see London as well placed as it can be to be the listing venue of choice for these companies. Um, I think that's about my eight minutes, so I'll stop there, but thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to hearing the other speakers. Um, wonderful. Thank, thanks so much, Claire. Um, I'll, I'll move on to our, our fourth speaker, Chris Locke. Um, Chris is a partner at Ernst & Young in London, where he leads the, the financial services transactions uh, diligence team, which covers uh, IPOs, public to private deals, debt and equity raises, acquisitions and divestments. Chris has worked uh, for over 20 years in, in the financial services industry and he worked closely with, with Lord Hill on the, the UK listing review. So we're, we're really delighted to, to welcome him and hear his insights on this. Thanks very much, Hannah, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is just quickly run through a little bit more about the context behind the Hill review and some of the thinking that went into it as, as we went through the process and then sort of pick through some of the considerations when we thought about DCSS and uh, where we got to on the recommendations there. So. Uh, very much as Anne has mentioned beforehand, there's been a strong drive from the government side to consider how we can boost the UK as a destination for IPOs and to optimise the capital raising process. Um, there's also equal uh, highlights within the, the terms of reference that Lord Hill got to be uh, considering the UK's high reputation for listing standards, governance, shareholder rights and transparency. And I think that really filtered through into the, the, the clarity point that says, you know, this was not a review designed at what people sometimes term as the Singapore on Thames, the reduction in regulation across the UK. That was sort of met with, with terms of horror uh, as we sort of worked through the process where people sort of considered, considered that and pushed that forwards for us. Um, very much thinking more around the refinement of the existing listing rules and evolution. It's very clear it's not a silver bullet for the market in the UK, but it starts to go some steps towards solving some of the challenges in the industry at this stage and hopefully as those recommendations come through and we go through the various consultations with uh, treasury fca etc we'll start to see some more traction on that going forward so um moving on to dcs then so uh 
this was probably a part of a package of considerations uh, that came pretty much pass and parcel with free float and the level of free float being offered. Uh, um, Claire, I think, has made reference and Anne also to, to level of voting rights and the terms on which you can do voting. So very much intertwined there and also somewhat intertwined with track record requirements and the ask to demonstrate a history of performance in, in businesses before they get uh, eligibility for the premium listing under listing rule six. Um, in, in terms of the actual dual class share structures, it's fair to say that absolutely got the biggest volume of feedback in terms of the request for evidence. So I think I think we got 65 responses back from the market and there was reasonable reams on this uh, and very clearly there was a huge swath of uh, considerations here with some sides being absolutely pro the change and others absolutely anti the change. So. There was a, a huge amount of effort to work through that, and that was followed on by a large number of roundtable um, exercises that were done to, to get people sort of in, in more detailed responses to that and the reasoning behind it, um, and also really on some of the one-to-ones as well. So we were, we were very clear that this is an area of, of tension in the markets uh, between many of the interested parties. Um, I think, as Luca mentioned, it was very clear that uh, you know, just for getting onto a premium listing doesn't necessarily make you eligible for index inclusion. Um, and uh, you think about the FTSE Russell, how they may adapt their um, eligibility requirements for that going forwards. I think um, actually though, one of the bigger challenges about consideration of dual class share structures and, and the eligibility for a premium listing really is around the challenges we have in the UK market about the, how people view the standard market, standard segment versus the premium segment. And a lot of recurring challenges we really see is that no matter how good you are, if you're not on the premium segment, people say, but you're not on the premium segment. And it becomes a real dent and a real challenge for people to actually explain why you go for a standard listing rather than a premium segment. And actually the fact that we've got that, that separation within the UK and the challenge of that that split is actually one of the bigger drags out there. Um, and I think actually the index inclusion becomes slightly secondary after that in terms of actually, if you can demonstrate your highest levels of governance, demonstrate that you can get to that standard, you know, excluding, uh, you know, the, the share structure that we're debating now, um, actually that goes a huge way to helping people demonstrate that they've got a robust business that's suitable for investment going forwards. And funnily enough, you know, considerations of the indices actually was thinking the other way to say, well, actually, if we have a large volume in the longer term of very high performing businesses in the standard segment or on the premium segment that are currently excluded from indices, you might find indices changing their thinking about what is the right company to include in their index going forward. So we were very much seeing it actually coming the other way to say that you might find that there's a lot of unhappy shareholders there that saying I've got a passive fund and I'm missing out on all the opportunities with these wider businesses because of that exclusion. So, you know, two ways to go on that. And, and obviously that's a long way to go into the future, but something that was sort of front and center of mind as we went through these considerations. Um, it was also very clear from us that, you know, dual class share structures have a massive range in terms of just one golden share to, you know, effective control of the businesses and therefore you know you can't just take dual class share structures and say good or bad you really have to look into the individual circumstances for businesses and think about what are those businesses trying to achieve with those structures versus where they are with their peers where they are with the market and where they where they are with the challenges and the governance side of things as well um, having gone through all of those considerations and the drive it became sort of clear to the advisory panel that just a set of disclosures probably wasn't going to be enough to counter that consideration and the concerns more broadly from, from some of the parties that, uh, that that sufficiently gave investors enough insight that they could make a decision without, without those protections. And hence, as Claire has mentioned beforehand, therefore the, the Hill Review came up with a variety of guardrails as we put them in to help limit the, the um, extent of that dual class share structure within a premium segment. Um, and that was really much about this refinement of regulation rather than the removal of regu regulation to say, where is an appropriate level that means you can get founders who have got huge challenges and concerns. And we, we listened to an awful lot of them as we went through that process versus you know the challenges and concerns of the loss of some of that governance and challenge that side and sort of try to thread the needle a little bit 
on, on that to get to a point where we felt we had a balance between enabling that to remove some of those barriers for a lot of those, you know, fast growth companies out in the market. As Anne mentioned, we've got a we've got a good growing percentage there. I mean, we want to make sure we're limiting the barriers into the um, into the IPO market going forwards. So um, a very interesting process. You know, three months. It was it was fairly fast and fairly high paced to get to get through that. Um, and ultimately, now we look forward to seeing, you know, consultation from the FCA in due course um, and seeing where we get to. But undoubtedly, there will be continuing to have lively debates on the subject for uh, many years to come. That's all I'll say for the moment. Thank, thanks so much, Chris. Um, I'll, I'll move on to our, our, our fifth speaker. Um, so our fifth speaker is Dionysia Kataluzu, um, Dr. Kataluzu. Um, Dionysia is a, a senior lecturer in corporate law at King's College London and a research associate at the Centre for Business Research in Cambridge. Um, Dionysia's research focuses on comparative and transnational corporate law and corporate governance, financial market regulation and law and finance. Uh, much of Dionysia's research looks at the role of institutional investors in corporate governance, and she also leads the ECGI supported Global Shareholder Stewardship Research Group. Um, over to you, Dionysia. Thank you so much, Anna. And thanks to you and for inviting me to contribute to this very lively debate. Um, as the introduction by Anna probably showed, the perspective I'm going to bring to this debate is quite different uh, from what we have already heard uh, from the speakers. Um, five, 10, or maybe 15 years ago, I never could have imagined that a small activist hedge fund could have won board seats in one of the largest oil companies in the world uh, a couple of days ago for the purpose of climate change. And there are many astonishing features about this victory of engine number one against ExxonMobil, but from the perspective of what we're discussing today, I think it is interesting to ask whether this stunning battle would have even been possible if ExxonMobil had a dual class air structure. So this is the perspective I'd like to bring in within the next few minutes. And the question I'd like to ask is whether what we are asking from the institutional investors in the UK for years now, in terms of stewardship, is really compatible with the proposed regime on dual class shares. It is well known that since 2010, the FSA is asking from institutional investors, and even actually before, to act as stewards of the company they invest. Uh, the UK Stewardship Code 2010, which was revised in 2012, was designed to cure what was perceived to be the UK's primary problem, and that is rationally passive institutional investors in a country characterized by a dispersed ownership structure. In theory, this concept, this stewardship concept, makes sense in the UK, as institutional investors own majority of shares in listed companies, and therefore collectively have the right to steward the companies, if, of course, they have the incentive to do so, and that's a separate debate. But even though, in theory, the concept is sound, in practice, after a decade, the consensus is that the, the old code, the 2012 one, is not working. And in an attempt to address the critiques, the latest 2020 code shifted its focus to advancing an ESG agenda and contains a much broader concept of stewardship and of the techniques to be deployed to further stewardship than does the previous code. So it's not any more about engagement, but it's much broader. So consider now a company with a dual class structure. In such a company, even if institutional investors own a majority of shares, they will not have the collective legal power to steward the controlling founder. Therefore, even if we assume that the 2020 stewardship code succeeds in transforming institutional investors into actively engaged stewards, these investors will not have the collective voting power to steward listed companies with dual class shares. So in such companies, institutional investors will be more akin to absentee tenants rather than absentee landlords that Lord Minus grumbled about in his review of the pension fund industry in 2001. Of course, one could argue that there is no need for an institutional investor to act as a steward when there is a founder with a controlling voting power, because this founder will have the legal rights and, of course, the incentives to steward the company. Of course, here, previous literature highlights that there is space for private benefits of control and um, agency costs. 
So the threat that um, a dual class structure poses from shareholder democracy explains why there is a clear institutional investor in the state for dual class stock for decades now, not only in the UK, but also abroad. I don't have the time to go into the details of that, but at, at the same time, it is interesting to note that in practice, institutional investors have supported several IPOs with dual class structures, especially in the US, which shows that sophisticated investors often rely on private ordering. And I think we have Bernie with us together with, uh, who wrote a very interesting article about private ordering. Um, so in practice, institutional investors are willing to invest in high performing companies. Snap in 2017 is, is, is a key example of that. Uh, e even when there are ordinary uh, shares with no voting rights, and even when there are no sunset provisions. So this is an important consideration for the UK, given that the overwhelming majority of shares are owned by overseas investors, which are already assessing the wealth maximizing efficiency of IPOs with dual class shares elsewhere. Turning now to the, specific, uh, to, to the specifics of the Hill review, it is clear that many institutional investors have already expressed their concerns in the responses to the review and have argued that the introduction of dual class shares in combination with the dilution of the 25% free float requirement would effectively shield the management from shareholder pressure and allow them to run the company without any control. One of the key arguments presented uh, by the investor, which, which is also supported uh, by the empirical literature, is that dual class share structures insulate the management from the disciplinary force of the market for corporate control. What has not really been discussed is that such a structure also insulates the founder from the market for corporate influence. And this is the discipline um, and the impact associated with engagement and voting by minority shareholders. In other words, dual class shares leave very little space for the exercise of voice and the introduction of the proposed regime seems to undermine the stewardship code as the dilution of voting power severely weakens the ability of institutional investors to act as meaningful stewards. And this is why the International Corporate Governance Network, I think um, they have publicly described the simultaneous move towards stewardship and dual class share as regulatory schizophrenia. So the question now is, is it really a schizophrenic movement? We have already listened to some key arguments in favor of the regime from previous speakers. And I'd like, I'd like to bring another perspective here. Let's assume for a moment that we all agree on the merits of shareholder stewardship, which of course is itself very contested as well. But let's, ass let's assume that we all agree. Is it possible for an institutional investor to steward the founder in a company with a dual class structure? So, while in companies with one share, one vote structures, the direct target of stewardship is corporate mismanagement. In companies with increased concentration of equity ownership, shareholder stewardship could potentially play the role of monitoring the controlling founder and reducing tunneling. So although the founder rather than management should be the key target of shareholder stewardship where a company has a dual class share, there is surprisingly no code, no stewardship code which has explicitly adopted this conception of stewardship, not even in jurisdictions like Singapore or Hong Kong, which have dual class shares and a stewardship code. So here there is one possibility for the future. So uh, perhaps the FRC should reconsider its reporting requirements under the, the, the 2020 stewardship code and asks from institutional investors to demonstrate engagement and stewardship with controlling founders. Of course, and the high corporate governance standards can permit this in association with detailed disclosure by the issuer. Of course, a counter argument here is that stewardship has not proven to be entirely successful in companies with one share, one vote structures. So how are we expecting from investors to act as stewards in companies with dual class structures? Um, I do not have the time to go deeper into this and probably Janice is going to bring the perspective of pension trustees. But one point I would like to make um, I think we also need to distinguish between um, the stage before the IPO and after the IPO. Before the IPO, I think that um, one could argue that a sophisticated investor is unlikely to suit itself in the food and invest in an IPO where he doubts about the abilities of the founders. So at this stage, the private benefits of control are quite low. And of, of course, a counter argument here is that 
you know, even if institutional investors avoid those IPOs permitting dual clash firms on the premium tier could give them an implicit regulatory seal of approval that could attract unsuspecting retail investors. Plus, here there is the issue with the index funds. But one could say that retail investors constitute a nominal presence in the UK public market. So maybe that's not a uh, number one problem. I think, however, that the, the risk uh, are higher after the IPO. Um, consider, for instance, the effectiveness of independent directors or the effectiveness of corporate governance standards in controlling shareholder firms. Um, and, and here is where I think that the inclusion of the safeguarding measures proposed by the Hill Review are really important to offer to find a compromise position between an outright prohibition of dual class share structures and allowing issuers freely to adopt, uh, to, to adopt a perpetual dual class structure. We can debate of each of those measures and one should be aware of the very low market acceptance observed in Hong Kong and Singapore after the introduction of similar um, safeguards. Being conscious of the time, I'd only like to take one minute to highlight what I think as a problematic aspect in relation to one of these safeguards from the perspective of stewardship. And this is the proposed maximum voting differential of 20 to 1. From the perspective of stewardship, this is likely to undermine the monitoring of controllers from institutional investors because the founder could control 50% of the voting power with only 4.8% of the shares. In my view, the proposed ratio is too high and creates huge divergence between control and ownership. And there is empirical evidence that the wider the divergence, the lower the associated firm valuation. So again, from the perspective of stewardship, a lower ratio, perhaps 10 to 1, which still gives to the founder voting control with a stake, I think, of 9.1%, is capable of constraining potential agency problems and perhaps better aligning the interests of the minority shareholders and the founders. I'm going to stop here, but we will certainly have the opportunity to discuss the different aspects in the second part of the session. Thank you. Great. Th thanks so much, Dionysia. Um, I'll, I'll introduce our penultimate speaker, Janice Turner. So Janice is the founding co-chair of the Association of Member Nominated Trustees. Um, the AMMT is a not-for-profit organisation supporting member-nominated trustees and representatives of UK-based pension schemes, ensuring that the voices of pension scheme members are heard in industry and government. Janice has been named as one of the most influential people in the pensions industry, and she is also a member of the Financial Reporting Council's Investor Advisory Group. Um, Janice, we're, we're really delighted to welcome you and hear your perspective on this. Well, um, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for your very kind invitation uh, for me to, uh, to speak today. The question I want to start, ask, uh, start uh, with is, is in whose interests uh, is this change? Because um, it, it's clear um, we've, we've heard how it is in the interests of uh, the companies that are interested in, in holding this type of share structure. But how is it in the interest of the ultimate asset owner, the pension schemes that invest in the premium listed companies? And how is this in the interest of the ultimate beneficiaries, the pensioners who are dependent on a return on their investment for their retirement? A poor return on investment for many people is the difference between living securely or being unable to afford to heat their home in winter. So this is an important issue. What I'm talking about here is risk management and risk management in relation to the environmental, social and governance ESG issues concerning the companies that pension schemes invest in has been the subject of increasing regulatory pressure on pension schemes in the last few years. So I'd like to set this in the context of the requirements that trustees now have with regard to stewardship and the difficulties that they are having in fulfilling them. Um, pension scheme trustees are required to specify their policies in relation to financially material considerations, including those relating to ESG considerations, such as climate change over the appropriate time horizon of their investments. They must also set out their policy in relation to the exercise of the rights, including voting rights, attaching to the investments and undertaking engagement activities in respect of the investments. And they've got to state uh, in a published document how they have put this into practice, including holding their fund managers to account for actions taken on their behalf. So the direction of travel faced by trustees is towards holding their own voting policy that sets out how they believe companies should be governed and setting out how the votes associated with their assets may be cast when a, when, a, when a company fails to govern itself in accordance with the shareholders' policies 
and does not respond to engagement on the matter of concern. So I'm sure you can appreciate our view that being able to set our own voting policy and having it implemented by fund managers is a really important protection for our assets. Trustees are also under pressure from government. A report on executive pay by the Bayes Select Committee some time ago stated, it is up to asset owners to give any direction on the stance to be taken by asset managers on corporate governance issues, including executive pay, and to hold them to account. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. It was excessive executive pay back in the shareholder spring of 2012 that drove the AMNT to develop red line voting, which was the UK's first publicly available off the shelf voting policy for pension scheme trustees that encompassed ESG issues. Trustees who had wanted to join in the opposition to executive pay had been told that because they invest in pooled funds, they couldn't do so. And it wasn't worth the fund managers while organizing split voting, even if they wanted to, as there was too little demand from the asset owners. So the AMT developed this voting policy following substantial consultation with the investment community, basing the policy on UK or globally endorsed principles, including the UN Global Compact. AMNT envisaged that pension schemes could adopt the policies and require their fund managers to operate them on a comply or explain basis. The fund managers were free to vote contrary to the red line policies, but if they did, they were required to explain why. So it was a shock to asset owners, therefore, that when those in pooled funds began adopting the red lines, major fund managers refused to accept their clients' policies. Fund managers' arguments have been many and varied, but our recent report, Bringing Shareholder Voting into the 21st Century, concluded that none was insurmountable. If the government and UK regulators are expecting asset owners to raise their game with respect to, to the development of robust stewardship policies and taking into account beneficiaries' views in their approach, how can we take these views into account if we can't even get fund managers to take our own views into account? So at a time when pension scheme trustees in pooled funds in which roughly half the assets under management in the UK are invested are being denied the right to have their voting policy respected even on a comply or explain basis, this proposal for dual class shares, some may consider to be the last straw. How are we expected to hold a company to account for its governance when in practice we have no influence at all? It would seem that this proposal could be summed up as these companies with dual class shares wanting our money, but without the appropriate accountability. There is the suggestion that the dual class shareholding um, could be uh, declared, uh, uh, dual class share voting could be limited to, for example, ensuring that directors continuing their jobs and that the company can't be taken over. But this, in effect, gives directors free reign to ignore investors even more than the asset owners were being ignored before. One response to this might be for investors and asset managers to no longer bother to engage with investee companies over matters of concern and instead to just pull their investment if they disagree with governance issues. But that goes against what is considered to be best practice. What investors are supposed to be doing is engaging with companies and discussing these issues in the hope that they will be resolved. But even this doesn't square it. Because the advantage of premium listing, as, as earlier speakers have pointed out, is that there are many funds out there that are index funds. So asset owners investing in these funds will invest in these companies, whether they want to or not. I'm aware of suggestion, suggestions that perhaps changes could be made so that index funds can exclude them. But isn't this starting to look like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut? Do we really need that nut that badly? And there's also the suggestion of a five year sunset clause, and I'm, I'm sure that the lobbying would have started to extend this from the minute that it was introduced. So in this context, where asset owners are still fighting to have fund managers even pay attention to their voting policy, making it even more difficult to have influence on a company is to travel in the wrong direction. Elsewhere in the Hill uh, Review, the report does come near to the issues that I've raised here. One of its recommendations is to consider how technology can be used to improve retail investor involvement in corporate actions and their undertaking of an appropriate stewardship role. It points out that the transition from defined benefit to defined contribution pension arrangements is putting the retail investor at the heart of decisions associated with their future, but also means they're carrying more of the investment risk and as such should be considered in any redrawing of the listing rules landscape. It adds that the cost, speed and efficiency benefits from introduction of technology have yet to be felt by retail investors but it has the potential to bring a greater level of transparency, resilience, as well as democratization of access to parts of the capital markets for all investors. It recommends that as Bayes takes forward the work on intermediated securities, it should consider the most efficient way of using technology to improve the position of retail investors, seeking to empower future generations of savers. What the UK listing review team has not appreciated is the reality that the issues faced by retail investors in being unable to use their votes is also the reality of most pension schemes that invest in pooled funds. 
Another of the review's recommendations is for the Treasury to consider and act on industry concerns in relation to the wider financial ecosystem concerning unlocking pension investment. So it makes it clearer than ever about how they would like pension scheme investment in listed companies. Well, if they want more pension scheme investment, they really need to ensure that we get the stewardship and voting rights that should come with that investment. But so far in the main, particularly with smaller pension schemes, we have not. So I would conclude that at a time when pension schemes are fighting for their right to direct their asset owner votes, even on a complier explained basis, now is not the time to enable companies to become premium listed, but reducing still further the accountability to the asset owners that should be an unquestioned prerequisite for investment. And if this does go ahead, then returning stewardship and voting to the asset owners has to be part and parcel of that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Janice. Um, last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ewan McGahey. Ewan is a reader at the School of Law, King's College London, and a research associate at the CBR in Cambridge. Uh, his core research interests are economic and social rights, uh, particularly in the governance of enterprises. Um, so I'll hand it over to, to Ewan for our last presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, for chairing. Um, thank you to all the speakers who have already gone. Uh, I think it's a really fantastic exchange and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the contributions from uh, the audience um, and, and all participants uh, very soon. Um, so should dual class shares uh, be premium listed? Uh, I want to offer a, a different perspective to what's already been said. And, and, and the main argument that I'd like to put forward is that we should be moving to a system where more people can vote uh, and participate in corporate governance, uh, not fewer. Um, and uh, that's really important to solve some of the really big challenges that are facing corporate governance in the 21st century, uh, escalating inequality and climate damage uh, probably being the biggest two. Um, so uh, I think when we look at the empirical literature, uh, it's fairly clear to see that there's not sort of decisive evidence one way or another, empirical evidence about whether dual class share structures uh, are good. Uh, usually that empirical uh, data or the, the studies look at share, uh, returns to shareholders and evaluate whether you know, dual class shares are good on that basis. Uh, so it, it, it's fairly clear that there's no decisive evidence one way or another about dual class share structures. Uh, but I want to put it to you that when we look at the history, and we, when we look at the evidence of not effects on social, uh, shareholder returns, but on social effects, uh, the evidence is much more clear. Uh, and so I've got uh, three main points. Uh, the first is that history shows the dangers of dual class share structures or multiple voting shares or non-voting shares, any departure really from the one share, one vote norm. Um, the second main point is that when we have a purpose of interpretation of UK company law, uh, and, and this, I think, is the, the difference uh, of my perspective uh, the, 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 that I'm bringing um, uh, to the debate, is that when we look at company law, dual class share structures can't stop a majority of members from removing the board of directors under the Companies Act Section 168. Uh, and that's very clear, I think, from a purpose of interpretation of company law. So it actually doesn't matter uh, what, um, what, what we do with the listing rules. Um, and, and the third main point is that I think there's little evidence of innovation, uh, and actually there's a lot of evidence of a great deal of harm in companies that have had dual class share structures. Uh, so I'll get to those uh, at the end. Um, so uh, first of all, the, the first main point uh, is about the history. Um, so when we look uh, back in time in the UK, we haven't really seen dual class share structures being widespread uh, since the days of the East India Company uh, or in the sort of dark times uh, in the 19th century. Um, they were, however, uh, growing uh, as a major feature, dual class share structures became a major feature of US corporate law, uh, particularly in the 1920s in the run up to the Wall Street crash. Uh, and this began or exploded particularly uh, with a big issue of non-voting shares uh, by the Dodge Motor Company in 1925. Um, so this triggered a big social response by the investment community, by uh, the shareholders all around um, uh, America. And uh, the, but the slide into taking voting rights away from shareholders uh, was one of the big uh, reasons identified by the Great Law and Economics Partnership 
Burley and Means uh, as being one of the causes of corporate unaccountability uh, in the lead up to the Wall Street crash. Uh, it was changed in the New Deal uh, so that uh, by law, a New York Stock Exchange practice of uh, discouraging uh, dual class shares or non-voting shares uh, in particular or multiple voting shares uh, was put into uh, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, practice uh, and that lasted up until the 1980s uh, with a change of regulation by the Reagan uh, government. Uh, it, it was even worse in Germany before you know, the Great Depression and the Wall Street crash. Um, in the 1920s in Germany, according to one study in 1925, uh, around 1 40th of capital, total capital in German companies, accounted to 38.2% of all the voting rights. Uh, so German unaccountability in the corporate world was extreme, even more extreme uh, than in the United States. And of course, the large corporations, largely unaccountable, the boards of directors, largely unaccountable to any of their investors, uh, were uh, working with banks who also were taking more and more voting rights. And these were the very people, and I think this is no exaggeration to, to say, these were the very people who were backing the fascist government uh, in the beginning of the 1930s. So all of this experience is what led in the UK after the Second World War uh, to the Cohen Report in 1945 to look at director accountability. Uh, in 1947, we passed the Companies Act, uh, which introduced the rule that we have now in Section 168 that says a majority of uh, uh, shareholders or, or with, with one share, one vote, or a majority of members and voting rights can dismiss the board regardless of anything in the company's articles. And it's very important that at that uh, point in, in the uh, House of Commons, Sir Stafford Cripps, uh, who introduced the legislation, said the following. Uh, and this is effectively quoting from Burley and Means. I'll just read it out. He said, with the great growth in the size of companies, the old relationship, which really grew out of the idea of partnership, where individual owners were closely concerned uh, uh, themselves with management, had largely disappeared in the modern company structure. So that's the problem they needed to fix. Uh, the growth of groups or chains of companies which make the true economic entity rather than the company itself, where we get a whole complex of companies operating together, uh, that factor has further divorced management from ownership. Uh, so that was the language of the separation of ownership control seen in Burley and Means. Uh, and the main reason, you know, making sure that company directors were accountable for introducing uh, the, the legislation that we still have today, uh, ensuring that uh, investors are not disenfranchised. Um, so um, it, when we look at the case law as well, the House of Lords in 1970 addressed this issue and allowed dual class share structures, triple vote, uh, vote voting in a case called Bushel and Faith, uh, so that uh, in a very, very small company with three people, the directors couldn't be removed. But that's very, very different from the purpose of the legislation, which was targeting uh, big companies, you know, like those that would be in the premium listing section, uh, from having any kind of mechanism that would frustrate uh, the right of directors uh, to uh, the right of shareholders or investors to remove directors uh, by a simple majority. Um, so now if we look at uh, today, uh, I think even if we introduced dual class uh, share structure allowed them on the premium listing section, uh, it still wouldn't be possible for uh, the, share, uh, the, the directors to not be removed by a majority. And that's really important because, you know, when we look at companies like Deliveroo and we see the founder, Will Shu, holding 50% of the votes with just 6% of the stock, it's very clear that there's not going to be an accountable governance structure uh, resulting from this. Um, I, I think Anne was absolutely right to mention the employment practices of Deliveroo, you know, before the world's, uh, London's worst ever uh, IPO. Uh, Deliveroo drivers, or, or, or cyclists rather, uh, are often being paid as little as two pounds an hour. Um, the a third of them, one study has uh, shown, uh, it, it sees the, the drivers or the cyclists um, earning below a minimum wage. So that's, that's a third. Uh, and, and so this is really not the sort of structure that we should see in employment practices that we should see uh, from an accountable company. Um, and then there's the argument that we want to encourage innovation. Uh, so we have companies like Facebook or Twitter or Google with dual class share structures. I mean, really these are advertising companies as opposed to you know, the sort of uh, reputation of big tech. And if we just focus on Facebook, you know, with complete unaccountability 
of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, we see uh, awful social effects, you know, not least the national terrorist attack on the US Capitol, you know, with uh, uh, su support for the extremist uh, politics represented by Donald Trump being drummed up through Facebook. We have televised mass shootings like at the mosque in New Zealand uh, and the encouragement of genocide in Myanmar. The, the social effects are very, very severe when we have companies that are unaccountable. Alibaba is another good example. It's just been fined uh, the biggest fine ever in Chinese competition law history uh, for anti-competitive uh, anti or monopolistic practices. Uh, so actually the best thing that we can do is empower people more, uh, much like Janice was saying. You know, we do definitely have a problem with short-termism. I, I think that the Khalifa Review and the uh, Hill Review have raised really important points uh, about uh, short-termism and founders wanting to uh, have their positions protected. Uh, but the best way that we do that is that we change the asset management industry by making sure that BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, you know, the big asset managers that are voting on other people's money are accountable to the real investors. So that's the best thing that we can do, enfranchise more, not fewer people. Um, thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Ewan. Um, so, so that concludes our, our formal presentations for the evening. And I'd, I'd just like to say thank you so much to all of our speakers. It's been absolutely fascinating whirlwind through so many different interesting perspectives, more perspectives than I'd anticipated um, on this issue. Yeah.